My name is Morgan Kubesi. We'll be talking about Slack, which is the road to continuous learning and improvement. Um, I work at Murex in the business intelligence domain as a full stack developer and coach uh, here in Paris and in a distributed team from uh, Paris, Dublin, and Beirut. To give you a quick context, if you haven't read what was written in the meetup, so basically I want to talk to anyone that's having practiced Scrum, okay? or something similar, any iterative uh, agile context. Uh, are you struggling today uh, to sort of stay above water even though you're trying to be agile and follow the ag agile philosophy? Or are you over committing in your iterations? Okay? Are you um, committing to them but really not delivering or sometimes, sometimes delivering, sometimes not, sometimes delivering, sometimes not and you have this, you know, burn down chart that looks like an F or like, a, <laughs> like an L. Um, and you start to ask yourself, Am I really agile or am I really fragile? Why not just do waterfall? I mean, <laughs> or are you just doing waterfall and it works for you, but in general, you have no time to learn new things. So do we have people like that here today? Sort of, at least, okay. I, I'm in that, I'm, I'm there. I need to listen to myself, by the way. So uh, what we'll try to answer the question is, how can we continuously learn, improve, while we maintain that productivity and happiness and motivation on the long run. Because we do sprints, we call them sprints, but they're sprints in a marathon, right? So we can't keep sprinting all the time. Um, why does it matter? Because change is inevitable. The only thing that doesn't change is that change will happen, right? So if you don't change, you won't be here for long. So I talk about the concept of organizational slack. Slack in itself is just a degree of freedom that the company has to change, okay? Now, You've seen this in the real world, right? You've seen the power lines, that's slack. It's the definition of slack, you know, because they have to move, right? You've seen this in the bridges, you drive your cars on. There's slack in case, you know, there's change in the temperature, whatever, so they can expand and contract. And it's the same thing for an organization, because if the organization can only go fast, like the dragsters, that's great, but they can't do that, right? So we have to be agile, we have to be agile. We have to be able to go fast, but we have to be able to look at the road ahead that it's not always straight, okay? So, what is agile? I'm not talking about dogmatic approach to agile, I just wanna focus on the response to change because software development in itself is a very uncertain and turbulent environment, right? We don't know what happens tomorrow, things change. And this sort of comes with your talk earlier that how can we be generous and learn and improve and, and look at the code. So I really like to take a look into not only that we're supposed to change, but we also have to be happy and be motivated. And that's sort of the Agile principles from the Agile Manifesto. They say we should be able to do that while we can sustain it. So if we're not doing those, we're not really trying to, we're not really being agile. And it's very easy to look, you know, to overlook the fundamentals. So, not only do we have to get things done, but we have to be able to learn, grow, and enjoy it while we do it, right? Or else we can, you know, it's like breaking uh, rocks in prison or playing football, you know? It's a, it's, it's a completely different, if that's your sport. So being happy is very important. I'm not going to go into details, but if you are happy, the study's fine, that you're more productive, you're more creative, you're less likely to leave your company, and you get sick less, so you get to work more. So that's good for the organization. And before I go into how we can do that, um, uh, in, uh, introduce Slack, how about we remove Slack? So have you, you know this game? It's where you have, it's basically tiles. I used to play it as a kid and you have to reorder the tiles from one to 10. And so awesome, we can play it because of that space. Now if someone comes in here and say, oh, there's a space and we're not efficient, let's add a nine, <laughs> right? So we're 11% more efficient, but we lost the whole purpose. We can't really play the game anymore. We're stuck with this layout forever. So sometimes less is more, right? And the other way to look at this is when we, we sort of try, I mean, it's, it's the same idea of sub-optimizing, okay? So you could actually make a system more efficient or, or try to think you're making it more efficient, but in fact, you're actually hurting it. So in this case where you have uh, sort of this flow, okay? So this flow of information or flow of work between you, Bilal, Jonathan, Simona, and work has to come in from here and go out from here. Now, if you're all taxed at 100%, right? You're like, I'm doing all the work possible. The problem is we have to look at it from the perspective of the system. The work that comes in from here, it has to wait in some backlog. These cubes are backlogs. And then once you have the time, you work on it, then you send it to Bilal, but Bilal puts it in his backlog, right? Yada, yada. 
So for the time, for the work, there's all this time wasted of the work staying uh, in between people, right? So it takes a lot more. Now, if we're able to introduce the slack, what we saw, remove that nine from the tiles, right? And once the work comes to you, you can easily handle it and pass it on to Bilal, who will pass it on to Simona. And the time it takes for work to flow through the system is much faster. Not only that, that gives Bilal the time to think, because Bilal, in fact, was only in this workflow because historically some organizational chart and mishap, he was there, people send him mails, he forwards them, though, I don't know why. But I'm always busy to think about this, right? I'm too busy to think about. And Bilal was able to breathe, reinvent, and think, and not only figure out that there's a problem, but he was able to do the necessary change. And this is, this is, these are things we need. If we want to improve, even if we know our mistakes, we need the time to be able to apply the better solutions. So this is more or less what Slack is. It's an investment for long-term health. Without it, you're a puppy underwater. With it, you're chilling, OK? So that's great. But how can we do this? How can we gain this agility, uh, time to invest, reduce the stress, be happy, and retain personnel. How can we do this? I'm not going to go into details. I only have a few minutes left. But there's iteration, velocity, and technical debt that I'll try to incorporate into the next part. So we have iterations. We have your estimated work completed. And you have that big part of the iceberg that no one sees but you. And Martin Fowler puts it in a very nice way with a, a quadrant that says deliberate, unintended, versus reckless, and careful. And everything that falls in between is some sort of technical debt. All right? That being said, when we incorporate Slack into an iteration, we use it as a stabilizer. So we said, you know, you have this problem of not being able to commit. Well, great. If this is what your velocity looks like, you know, uh, uh, Scrum says it's supposed to go up, right, with time. Well, just commit to less. Pick the least and do something like this. Say that 20% is, I'm not going to work. Okay, that's, you know, you say, what? Not going to work. It was very hard for me to talk to my managers and stuff back in the days, but they'll see the picture in time. Um, so leave it for non-critical work that you can set aside in case of an emergency. We'll see that in a second. So technical debt, like you said, it's everybody accumulates technical debts. And if you're too busy, you'll never be able to tackle it. So tackling it can help us improve our velocity across time. And if we don't, best case scenario is going to stay the same. All right? What is technical debt? What is technical debt? Any examples? Anyone? All right. So, Depend, other than spaghetti code or whatever you want to call it or some project you never want to look at again, very simple things. That, you know, the code is not the code, as Brice was saying earlier. Dependency versions, recurrent manual tasks you have to do all the time, static host analysis, warnings that you keep getting, tests that are not there, tests that are read but still we push to production, um, variable names that no longer match what the code is about. These are all technical debt. So what we could do, <coughs> what we could do, <laughs> What we could do is basically do this all the time. Have this sort of concept of looking at the code, and every time we're able, so that 20% gives us a time, every time I'm trying to fix something in the code or develop a new feature, and I'm changing old code, to think about these and try to remove this technical debt as I go. And it's a good example if you ever have to, if you see technical debt and you can't fix it, to add a to-do or something, that you can, so someone else in the team can see it later. Now, Automate all the things, if you can. <laughs> Refactor. Uh, explore further with exploratory testing on the features that you're building. And if there are warnings, fix them. I'm talking about old code, not only the new code. The new code, you should already be doing this. But for the old code that you'll probably be changing, try to spend that time. And the beauty of this is, that we'll see later, this incorporated with some time to learn and grow, which is research. Because with research, in fact, the problem is you might not have that time to learn and widen your range. So. What we could do is set, a, set at the end of the iteration, before the last day of the iteration, half a day in the morning for everyone to learn. Read a book, learn design patterns, uh, watch a video, um, so some books if you're interested. Watch videos together, do some online courses together, and this will allow you to improve and grow. Every, so if your iteration is two sprints, you're talking about half a day every two, uh, every two weeks, excuse me. So, and the nice thing about this is it acts as a stabilizer because it becomes a buffer. If you have these problems ever, your CI doesn't, is read for no reason, you have no idea why, some new production issue comes in that you had not factored into your iteration, estimation, all these things. Someone gets sick, how do we, how do we factor in that? So what you could do is make your Slack become that shock absorber. You remove that red percent, you, you take it, and you are able to do less refactoring on the old code, 
and win some time. And if you have a bigger problem, then you cancel that research time that you have on that half day, which gives you an extra half day. Now, keep that uh, in mind that if it's too big, it's another problem. You have to look at it and you have to retrospect and try to figure out. But it's not going to solve everything. However, if you're always canceling your slack, that's a problem. That means you don't have slack, in fact. So we go back to the you're overcommitting and try to undercommit. So in general, um, to sum up, sort of, if you incorporate the slack, you consistently meet your iteration commitments. You rarely need overtime. It's okay, you can do overtime, but not every day. Um, you and by paying down that technical debt, you're able to improve your code, making further changes to your code a lot faster. And with the research time, obviously, you're able to develop more effectively and have a wider range and see things from a different perspective. And that sort of sums up what I have to say, that you have to invest in Slack because you invest in it, you invest in yourself and your organization's long-term health. So references, in case you're interested. And uh, thank you very much. So I got, um, I got the slides here, which is the original slides, because this is a 40-minute talk or 30-minute talk that I had to, <laughs> yes, I had to compress. So I got the original slides up there, uh, the YouTube video. I, I presented this at DevOps Poland uh, recently, so you can see that as well if you're interested. And then the rest is my social media, LinkedIn, blog, and Twitter. So how do you make uh, employees happy? Well, the employees have to tell you. Uh, the, the thing is to listen to your employees. The thing is to give them the time to be happy, because um, ha if they're always struggling, they're, they're, they're always going to feel that they're drowning. It's, it's not going to be there. But if you give them the time to grow and learn, right, that should help. I mean, it's, it's not going to magically make them happy, but you just give them the platform to be. The question is, how do you handle a very big change? Because if you just incorporate half a day of Slack or 20% of an iteration, how can that s uh, save someone like Kodak or Nokia when a big change in technology comes? The thing is, if you are, what I believe, right, is if you are giving the people, it, it's like the dots we saw earlier with the Reddit. And by the way, I drew that thing up there, that yellow and red, uh, red devil. Um, <laughs> if you give people the time, they will invent for you. They will help you write this uh, wave of change. It's not, it's not one day you wake up, oh, we're going to do an iPhone. You have to give people the platform again to innovate, to look at the market. To, and the thing is, the, the other problem is, as we saw with the flow, if you say, OK, we know what we have to do, but it takes forever to do it because everyone's so busy already doing a million other things. Yeah, yeah, OK, OK, yeah. And you've built this very big, I gave a very small example of a workflow, but you can imagine a big company like Nokia that has, I don't know how many people, but they're all working together. And you know, you're saying, OK, let's do this. And then it takes a year for the actual person that's going to do the job to actually get that information. So incorporating the Slack will help keep a lean uh, company that can respond to change and innovate. Uh, what kind of Slack do we have at Murex and uh, what are we doing? That's the question. So we have Slack at the iteration level, like I mentioned here. Uh, again, know your team, OK? Every team likes to do it in a different way. Like I spoke about doing technical debt all the time. Some teams try to book on Friday uh, a time to look at all the static code analysis that they have and try to solve them. So uh, what I've done with teams that I've worked with, um, sometimes we book two hours during the sprint itself to either do some exploratory testing. We've done some of that with Philippe. We uh, uh, pick some videos, and we sit together, and we watch agile architecture, emerging architecture versus top-to-down architecture, and we start to fight about it. Um, you, give, you give people a platform to debate and talk right, on something other than the code. And uh, we read. We read. We watch things together. And this is for the research time. And then there's the technical debt. So you're always able to pay down the technical debt as you go. And you try to tell people it's OK if you take more time on a story, right? Uh, if it's for the good cause. So this is at the level of the iteration. And each team can try to apply it in a different way. Then what we do is we, we use this sort of scaled, agile approach. Um, each sort of program has one sprint every five sprints that, is, that we don't code in. So we have four sprints. We plan for four sprints. We know that some of this is going to go into the fifth sprint. You don't start anything in the fifth sprint. You have around four days of hackathons or whatever it is you envision. It's up to the, it's up to the program. It's not only the teams, but all the teams together can decide on something. And then in the second week, we do a final program retrospective, and we plan for the next five sprints. 
So there's two levels. There's, uh, we do Slack at the level of the teams, and we do Slack at the level of the program. So how do you measure success of incorporating Slack, and how do you measure happiness? So uh, for measuring success, uh, there are things called improvement katas that you can apply. <laughs> Um, what you do know is also you can take a look, it depends on the metrics, right? Uh, so uh, you've, you've heard of sonar, for example. Um, it gives you a visual radiator of all the information. Um, one way is, you know, it gives you this weird $5,000 of technical debt, or I don't know what. That's a number. You can take a look at that. It just pick any metric that you have and see if it improves with time. It's not about the absolute value. Okay, so that's one way you can see success. Another thing is it's you go back to your burn down chart and you go down to your um, velocity per sprint. Is it still like this, then it's obviously not working. Is it improving with time? Then you, you're, it's being successful. Uh, for Matt, same that also links with happiness of employees is to look at uh, feedback. You know? So we do one-on-ones, for example, with our employees, with, with our colleagues. Um, we talk about <coughs> it. And you get this feedback uh, week after week. Because from my experience, people always tell you this. I don't have time to learn. I want to learn. I want to do this. And if you're giving them this platform, you, you should be getting this feedback back. And if it's not, then we're doing something wrong. Improvement kata is something interesting also to look into. Um, if just Google it and check it out. It's a very nice way to get some metrics on, on success criteria. <coughs> 